about um, the types of problems that we're looking to solve. I'll talk about how we represent states, how we represent goals. I'll talk about how we train our deep neural networks to generalize over goals. And then I'll talk specifically about how we specify goals in AMPERCEPT programming. And then I'll talk about how we actually reach these goals. And in our research, we have realized that you can specify goals um, such that you have some non-monotonic behavior using negation as failure. And not only can this be computationally um, advantageous, but you can actually find more efficient solutions when specifying goals using negation as failure and using some kind of conflict-driven search. And this is inspired by work, let's say, like SAT solving. And then at the end, I'll talk about future work. So first, let's talk about the class of problems we're looking to solve. And this is pathfinding problems. And so a pathfinding problem, uh, the objective of pathfinding is to find some sequence of actions that form the path from some start um, configuration to some goal. And a goal here in this context is a set of states. And of course, we have preferences for paths that have lower cost. And a pathfinding problem can be represented as a weighted directed graph. And so you see here, um, the nodes are your states, the edges are the actions that you have available to you, and those transition between states, and the weights on the edges are your transition costs. And so if you start here at this green node and your goals are, say, getting to either one of these two states, um, any path here would be a solution, but of course you would have preference for some minimum cost path. So this path here is um, cost three, which is just, just the sum of the edge weights. This one here is cost four, this one is cost four. You would have a preference for finding this path. And this is, uh, any pathfinding problem can be represented as this weighted direct graph. Now, what are examples of um, domains? So pathfinding problems can be found all throughout computation, robotics, um, the natural sciences, and I would argue almost any problem involving computation can be posed as a pathfinding problem. So one example that we use a lot in my research is the Rubik's Cube. Here the goal would be having all the faces be the same and you start from some start from here. You can pose theorem proving as a pathfinding problem. You can pose chemical synthesis as a pathfinding problem. You start um, from your building blocks and you want to find a sequence of chemical reactions to synthesize some molecule. Of course, lots of problems in robotics, um, program synthesis, and even quantum computing. So a lot of people are actually building off of our research in quantum computing to synthesize um, algorithms for quantum computers. Now, a pathfinding problems that people would deem interesting often have a lot of states. So for example, the Rubik's Cube, there are about 10 to the 19 configurations. Um, for other puzzles that we investigate, 10 to the 62. For organic chemistry, I just asked a bunch of chemists how many molecules there are, and one person said 10 to the 60. So I don't think this number is actually known, but there are a lot at this point. And so of course, we're not going to be able to encode this entire graph. And we then have to assume, okay, what is going to be given to us? We can't get the entire graph. What are we going to be able to get? And so the first thing is going to be um, the action space, what actions we have available to us, the state transition function. I'm in some state, I apply some action, what happens next? Um, the transition cost function, what is the cost of applying some action in some state? Um, and we also are going to assume we have some goal specification language. And um, we're going to have some goal test function to say, given our goal specification, have we reached the goal? And so this is what we're going to assume we have. We're not going to have any information about you know, how we're going to solve the problem, any hints that humans might have to solve the problem. We're just going to have the description of the problem. And our objective is to create a domain ind independent algorithm that is given as an input, the definition of the domain, some start state and some goal specification, and it finds a path to a closest goal state. So that's what we want to um, create. Now, in um, research I did here, during my PhD, we created this algorithm DeepCube A. And what DeepCube A was able to do is given a description of a domain, it trained a deep neural network to represent a heuristic function. What a heuristic function does is it maps states to the estimated cost to go, which is the estimated cost to go from some given state 
um, to some closest goal state via a shorter path. So it's estimating this. So you see here for each one of these nodes in the state, it has some heuristic value associated with it. It's not necessarily going to be the exact heuristic value. It's going to be approximately, hopefully, <coughs> close to the true heuristic value. And you can then use this with heuristic search algorithms. So for example, um, A star search, you can just plug this heuristic function into A star search. And we did some modifications on A star search to take advantage of these views. But basically, we're doing A star search with this heuristic. And you can find paths to go. And in the <coughs> puzzles that we investigated, we looked at things like the Rubik's Cube, sliding tile puzzle, lights out, soccer band. And in the cases where we could verify this, we found a shortest path in the vast majority of these cases. Um, we did this on the order of seconds. And um, we were able to scale up you know, these larger sliding tile puzzles, things like that. And this is essentially one algorithm, this deep cube algorithm. And you, this is actually still up. So um, if you go to this website, you can actually scramble the Rubik's Cube and see it solve it. So, uh, this is it. And uh, this is the paper that we published in Nature Machine Intelligence. OK. So there are a lot of limitations with this deep cube algorithm. One, the goal is predefined. So you have to have you have to know what the goal is before you even start training your deep neural network. So if you want to change the goal, you have to train your deep neural network again. And training could take between like a day and two days. So this is going to be very inefficient. Now there are methods such as hindsight experience replay that we have exploited for other applications of deep cube. And this can allow you to generalize over goal states. But this assumes that you have to know what the goal state actually is. So say, for example, you're trying to synthesize a chemical that has some properties. You can maybe specify the properties that it should have or should not have, but you might not know um, of a molecule that meets these specifications. And so this does not give you the ability to specify a set of states and find a path to some currently unknown goal state. So the way we want to solve this is we want to have some high-level specification language that can specify a set of goal states without actually having to know of a state in this set of goal states. And this will allow us to discover new states because when we find a path to this goal state, um, say we didn't know of any of these molecules, once we find a path to some molecule that meets these specifications, we, we will have discovered this molecule. Um, we want the specification language to be able to represent um, diverse kinds of goal states. And so this should be robust. It shouldn't just be limited to a few different properties. And we want our uh, training to be goal agnostic. So if we shift to some other goal, we don't want to have to retrain or fine tune the neural network. Um, we want to just be able to use the neural network um, without having to do any more training. And feel free to stop me if you have any questions. So here is the overview of our training um, and our goal specification. And what I want to draw your attention to is we are training this heuristic function that is generalizing over start states and goals. And we assume that there is some function to translate some states to a set of descriptors. It can be any descriptors that you find relevant to the problem at hand. Um, and then based on these descriptors, we can do some sampling to go from describing a single state to a set of states. And then train our heuristic function to estimate the cost to go to this goal. And then when we are specifying goals, we have some specification language that, um, from which we can sample these descriptors, and we can give this to our, our neural network. <clears throat> and so in our work, these state descriptors are assignments of values to variables. So um, if you have done constraint satisfaction, you're familiar with this. You have some variables. You can assign some values. And the specification language we're going to use is antiset programming. And we can use antiset programming to describe goals at a high level and use an answer set solver to get what this is in terms of assignments of values to variables. But this is just how we do it in our work. Um, if you could do this, say, I don't know, with natural language or something like that, um, then you could also use this method. So it's not limited to logic. Now here is an overview of how we're going to reach goals. So here, this big circle is going to be the set of all states in our state space. And this pi is going to be some specification. And here we have this set of states 
um, related to some specification. And I have some high M and some high N. And I'll talk about what this means in a minute, but um, this is going to um, really briefly mean monotonic and non-monotonic specification. And we have in red all the other states that are not a goal state. And here we have our start state. And using answer set programming, we can then sample um, assignments that are a subset of these goal states. So we assume here we have some monotonic specification. And the interesting, the relevant property here is that anytime we, uh, we sample assignments, they are guaranteed to be all goal states. And so we can sample different assignments and find paths to these assignments. And, you know, there, that lets us find paths to goal states. But of course, we're interested in a closest um, goal state. We're interested in a shortest path. So here, these are not shortest paths. If we found something right on the edge here, that would be a shortest path. And so if you have a non-monotonic specification, you can sample assignments that actually um, include states that are not goal states, which may sound undesirable at first, but you can refine these assignments so that you actually get more and more um, specific assignments that could represent goal states. Now, there are two ways you could refine this. One is just randomly that doesn't take into account why the state you found actually is not a goal state. So you could end up you know, finding the same path over and over because you don't take into account why you failed. Um, but you can have this conflict-based, um, conflict-driven specification. And so here, you find a path, of course, this is a whole entire set of states. So you don't have to take any action. And you realize this is not a goal state. And you ask yourself, why is this not a goal state? And you use this to refine your specification. And so you no longer will find a path to the same state again, because you have taken into account what the conflicts are. And you find a path again. You realize this is not a goal state. Why is this not a goal state? You refine again, and um, you find a path. So. Um, we're going to be talking about these three methods of reaching goals in this talk. <clears throat> now I'll go over how we represent states and goals, um, just to give a bit of a, a background. And so the way we represent states is with assignments of values to variables, and each variable has a particular um, uh, kind of assignment you can make. So this is its domain. So there are certain values you can assign to these variables. And we represent assignments like this. So here's the variable, here's the value that we assign to it. And an assignment is a complete assignment if and only if all variables have been assigned values. So we assume in a, in a, in a domain, there's you know, a certain fixed number of, of variables. And a state is going to be a complete assignment. So for example, for the Rubik's cube, variables here would be stickers and assignments would be the colors that you assign to those. And so all their domains would be the same. They're just six colors. Now with goals, um, an assignment can be, a goal can be a complete or partial assignment. And a partial assignment is if there is some variable that is unassigned. And we can say that a state, and these assignments represent a set of states. And we can say that a state is a member of the set of states that is represented by a particular assignment if this state, which is just a complete assignment, is a superset of this assignment. And what this means is all assignments present in A are also going to be present in X. And for example, we could have an assignment that specifies this white cross here. And so as long as a Rubik's Cube has these um, white stickers in these locations, then it's going to be a member of the set of states represented. Are there any questions so far? All right. Now this of course imposes a, general, a generality relation. So we can say that A1 is a generalization of A2 um, if and only if A2 is a superset of A1. And this entails that the set of states represented by A2 is a subset of the set of states represented by A1. And this will be relevant when we're uh, specializing these assignments um, during search. And we can say that something is a strict generalization if this is a strict subset. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that this relationship between the states holds, that this is going to be a strict superset. 
Um, but this is a strict generalization. Okay. And so given this, what we then want is some specification language where we can describe, say, a cross pattern and then sample assignments that meet the specification. For example, we'll have this white cross, that's a cross pattern. You can have a green cross, so on and so forth. And so now we just need a specification language um, that can do this. Now, before we get into the specification language, we're going to talk about how we train our deep neural network to estimate the distance between um, some state and some assignment, which represents a set of states. So this was part of the overview that I showed previously. The way this works is we have some, we assume that there's some way to generate start states. And we take some random walk between zero and T steps. And this is inspired by hindsight experience replay. Now, this random walk could in the future be used with like artificial curiosity or something. Those times are purely random. But for now, we just take this random walk. At the end of this random walk, we have our terminal state. And we want to generate a set of states um, for which this terminal state is a memory. And the way we do this is we convert whatever this representation is to its explicit assignment representation. And then we randomly unassign variables between zero and all the variables. Um, so this is just sampled at random. And that then gives us our goal assignment. And we give it to our deep neural network and we do some reinforcement learning and that trains our heuristic function. Now um, we can do two, well, the, the methods that uh, we use in my research group, one is approximate value iteration. So you're just training your deep neural network to estimate the um, cost to go uh, from some state to some goal. You can also use Q learning. So this is training your deep neural network to estimate the cost to go um, from some state to some goal when you commit to taking a certain action. Um, so you can do Q learning as well. And there are some advantages to doing just Q learning um, with the search. But basically, this reinforcement learning update is here in green, and we train this using some mean squared error. And so here we have our transition function. Here we have our transition cost function. And this is just estimating our cost to go, and it's comparing it to what the neural network says and um, doing the update. And then we use this with heuristic search. And so with A star search, what this does is this maintains a search tree where nodes are states, edges are actions, and it explores nodes according to their priority. So you'd have their priority queue that's associated um, with this cost. And this cost is just an estimate of the cost, um, total cost of a solution when going through a particular node. So here is the cost to get from the start node to the current node. And here is the estimate of the cost to get from the current node, the state associated with the current node, to a closest goal state. And so that's how ASTAR search um, does its expansion. There's some theoretical properties we're not going to get into. Um, but then this terminates when a node associated with the goal state is selected from the queue. So that's um, how we find paths. Another way of doing this is with QSTAR search. So this is um, some work coming out of uh, my research group, as well as in collaboration with um, Roy and other people. And the, the QSTAR search exploits the structure of the DQN. This isn't like um, too relevant to this talk, but this, I just want to make it, um, I just want to uh, note it. And there's a funny story about this QSTAR search because um, there was some thing about OpenAI coming up with something called QSTAR. And my co author on this paper joked on Twitter that OpenAI is like, building off of our work and we did it first. It was like a joke. And um, it actually kind of blew up and Elon Musk responded to it. And then there were like all these videos saying like, oh, you know, this is what QSTAR is. And I don't know what QSTAR is, but um, I just thought it was funny. Okay. So any questions? So before we talk about the integration of answer set programming, we want to know how well our method is able to find paths from states to assignments. And so we are going to generate um, between, for different domains, 500 to 1,000 start and goal pairs. And the goals are going to be um, assignments. 
And we also have randomly generated assignments. So Zoom assignments could be, could actually specify just an entire state, or it could specify, you know, um, the entire set of states. So if you have an empty assignment. Um, so these random partial assignments are also generated. And we have a time limit of 200 seconds to find a path. And we compare this to VQB. And so this is just for the predefined goals. Um, we compare this to these classical planning techniques, in particular the staff downward planner. And this assumes that you're given your transition function um, in this first order logic language. And so our method does not, ass this assumes this transition function is a black box. You don't need to be able to actually um, write it out formally. But here this assumes a particular way um, for you to write it out. And it has different kinds of heuristics that can automatically be constructed and it uses this with some kind of ASAR search. And then there are these pattern databases that um, enumerate all possible combinations of subproblems and use that to create a heuristic and use it with a variation of ASAR search plus iterative deepening ASAR search. And this is also particular to some predefined pattern databases. Okay, so we have this big table. Um, first, this is split up between the canonical um, so, for example, for the root of Q, we have the canonical goal state, and um, we have just random assignments. And of course, for the random ones, we can't use deep QBA, we can't use the pattern databases because they don't generalize. And what we see here is that the deep QBA sub G, so this is the one that generalizes over goals, um, is generally on par or maybe a little bit worse than deep QBA say, for the canonical one. And I believe this is because the function that it's learning is more complex because it has to generalize over goals as well. It's not just specific to one particular goal. Um, but of course, you know, deep QBA, we can't use it for just any, any goal. And when we're just comparing this to any goal, we see that deep QBA solves um, many more than these classical planning uh, techniques. So for example, for the 24 puzzle, you know, these classical planning ones solve like almost 26% to deep QBA solves uh, 99.6%. Um, so deep QBA is able to generalize and it's able to find solutions. And um, when it does find solutions, it's usually via a shorter path than other methods. So this is the one we're going to use going forward, just because, not just because we came up with it, but because it performs better than other methods. Um, okay. so. Now let's talk about how we specify goals with answer set programming. I'll give a bit of an overview of answer set programming. And so an answer set program is a first order logic program that is composed of a set of logical <coughs> rules. And any answer set program defines a set of stable models, which is also known as an answer set. And I'll talk about what uh, a stable model is in a bit. And so the rules are of the following form. Um, we have these implications, and you can have these positive or negative literals, and negative just has this negation in front of it. And this has the um, closed world assumption, so it's using negation as failure. It tries to prove something, if it fails to prove it, then it just assumes that it's false. So that's the negation as failure. And this implication, of course, is true. So the body is true if and only if all the literals are true. And then this implication is true if and only if one of these two things holds. If the body is false, then it's vacuously true. Um, but if the body is true, then the head also has to be true in order for the implication to be true. So this is just some first order logic stuff. And there are particular kinds of rules that are important. One are facts, and these have empty bodies. So the head is always assumed to be true. Um, headless rules, so this is assuming that the head is false, Therefore, the body also has to be false. And um, in practice, these are used as constraints. So if you are saying like something like this can't happen, you could use a headless rule. And then choice rules. So if the body is true, then zero or more of the atoms in the chain can be added to the stable model. So for example, if um, the body is true here, we could add none of these, one of these, or both of these. What is a stable model? Well, a stable model is a set of ground atoms, and an atom here is just a predicate with some uh, uh, arguments, which, which none of the arguments are variables, all of the arguments are constants, so that's a ground atom. And 
it is a set of ground atoms um, of a particular anti-set program such that um, one, the set of ground atoms actually is minimal and it is exactly equal to the atoms derivable from the redux of the ground program. And you know, this, these are two new things I just um, introduced. So what is the ground program? You take all the rules in your anti-set program and replace variables by the ground rule, by ground um, terms, so constants that appear in your anti-set program. That's how you get the ground program. And then the redux is just taking into account um, what is true here in your stable model. So if something is true, then if it is negated in the body, then there's no way that rule can be true. So you delete all the rules that have negated atoms so, um, if that atom is present in the stable model. And then you delete all the negated atoms in the body of all the remaining rules because um, they're, not true, they're not true in your stable model. And so um, you don't have to worry about them um, because we have this negation of failure and that defines your stable model. Uh, it's not too important that you understand it, but it's just saying if I am able to say that this stable model is true and that this stable model is indeed minimal, um, and I get back the same ground atoms um, from my program, then this is a stable model. So I say this is true, I get all the same things back. That's a stable model. All right, so how do our ASP specifications look in this context? So the specification contains your background knowledge. So this can be reused across different goals. So you know, for the Rubik's Cube, um, what are the stickers? What are the shapes? Things like that. Um, it contains logical rules that have goal in the head. And this can change as you um, use different goals. It has a headless rule to um, ensure that for every stable model you return, the goal is true. And then it has a choice rule. And the choice rule contains um, ground atoms that represent assignments of values to variables. So for example, I can say this white sticker is at index zero. So this is um, assigning at index zero um, this white sticker. Um, and so this represents the assignment of values to variables. And here I'm going to represent this as the set of all possible assignments that can be obtained from a specification. And I have this two terminology here. So one is a candidate state, and it is a state that is a superset of some assignment um, that can be produced by your specification. And a goal state is actually a member of, it's actually an assignment that can be produced by your specification. And the candidate state and goal state is going to be relevant when we talk about um, non-monotonicity. So here's just an example of how we use answer set programming for the Rubik's Cube. We define basic background knowledge, like the colors, the faces, what a cubelet is, certain constraints, like you can't have two stickers um, of the same color on the same cubelet. Um, so just like basic constraints so that when we get stable models, we don't get you know ones that represent a set of states that is just the empty set. It still happens, but it's just reducing that. And we have this um, set of ground atoms, like I mentioned before, this at index. And the specifications we use are going to just be combinations of these different patterns. Excuse me. And just to reiterate, the training, set, uh, the training procedure is completely unaware of this. So it doesn't know anything about you know, these patterns or what goals are going to return. And you don't have to understand what's up what, like the actual code, but I just want to emphasize how easy it is to specify these things in answer set programming. So like a cross pattern, this um, canonical solve state where all the faces are the same. So you can define what it means for a face to be the same. So all the cubelets on that face um, are going to be the same. And then you say that, you know, there are six faces such that this is the case. So all six faces um, have the same color. <clears throat> and just with these two lines of code, you can define the canonical solve state. And this is just some um, constraints. For example, you can't have two different colors at the same index. You can't have two different um, stickers from the same cubelet on opposite faces. And this is just to show, again, this is just like one line of code and you can um, encode these uh, constraints. All right, any questions?
Okay. All right, so if our specification behaves monotonically, then all the candidate states are goal states. And so not in the ICAPS paper uh, we had previously, but in a paper where we talked specifically about this, we have some proofs. I don't have the proofs up here, but if you sample in assignments and your specification behaves monotonically, all the candidate states are goal states. And when I say monotonically, I mean that um, if you add more um, assignments, that you will never end up saying that this is no longer um, a stable model. So you can add more and more assignments and it will always be a stable model. Um, this is what I mean by mon monotonically. But it doesn't have to be um, related to ASP. It, it can just say, um, if I add um, more to this assignment, I'm still going to be in this green. So the set of goal states, I'll still be in there. Um, and I'll no longer, I, I won't say like, you know, this is actually not a goal state. Okay, so we can randomly then sample assignments until we find one that we can reach. So like I said before, some assignments may represent impossible states. So this actually isn't a state in the state space. Um, there are no states that have these properties. And so this would then just be the empty set. Or maybe sometimes you try to reach the goal, but you run out of um, the budget in terms of the number of iterations you have. And so we're just going to repeat this process until we find a path to the goal. And the answer set solver we use is Klingo. And one thing that's important to note is that, you know, this is agnostic to the cost of the shortest path. It's just sampling assignments. And um, you see here that none of these assignments are actually going to give you a shortest path, but Klingo doesn't know, doesn't care. And we'll talk about how we can use non-monotonicity to address that um, later. So the experiments we have, we have 100 start states, and we have five different goal states for the Rubik's Cube, including the Nautilus to fall state, and three different goals for Sakaban. And we use this batch and weighted version of A-star search, and we give it a budget of 50 iterations, and we repeat this until we find a path to the assignment, or until all the assignments have been seen. Now, here are our results. So for the Rubik's Cube, um, we have these four goals, and we have a fifth one, including the canonical solve state. One thing I want to draw your attention to. So for the canonical solve state, the average at cost for these 100 are, um, is 24.41. Now for this um, goal, this cross six, the canonical solve state is a member of this set of states, right? So if we have these crosses on all these bases, um, the goal state also has these crosses. So it is a member of the set of states, but there are states that are closer than the goal state, um, than the canonical goal state. And so you see here, the path cost is a lot cheaper. And this is indicative that our method is able to truly find a shortest path to, of course, an assignment, but there could be even shorter paths that you can find if say you, um, uh, well, actually here, there's only one assignment associated with it. But if you have, say, you know, millions of assignments, then it's going to be hard to actually find the shortest path because you'll have to see all those millions and take the minimum. Um, another thing I want to point out is sometimes we don't immediately find the shortest path and we have to sample other models. And this could be, you know, maybe it just failed to find a path because, you know, the heuristic function isn't as good, or it could just fail to find the path because it's representing something impossible. And so this is an issue that pops up with this cup four and um, this cup spot goal. Um, now, I'll, I'll talk a bit more about this in future work. Now for um, Sakaban, we have this goal where all boxes are immovable because you can only push boxes, you can't pull them. And so you tell them, you tell Sakaban to you know, make sure all the boxes are immovable. Um, this goal where you form this box of boxes and this goal where you have boxes at the four corners of the agent. Now, um, sometimes we fail to find a path to the goal. And in the paper, we show these failure examples. And it actually turns out that there wasn't any room for you to actually create these patterns. And so it actually looked at all the assignments, um, but it actually was unreachable. So it was impossible for you to find. Um, Another thing I want to say about, but 
Um, more details are in our ICAPS paper. So um, if you want to look at paper. Any questions? Now, the last thing I'm going to talk about um, in regards to finding leading goals is handling non-monotonicity. Now, because we have this closed world assumption, we use this behavioral failure, and therefore we can have this non-monotonic behavior. For example, if I specify that there should be a white cross with no yellow sticker on the white space, this is the assignment that I would get back because you cannot prove that there's a yellow sticker on the white face in this assignment, and therefore it assumes that it's false. Now, here is a state that is a member of the set of states, but has a yellow sticker on the white face. So when you add more assignments, you actually end up going from saying, uh, retracting your conclusion that this is a goal. So they'll say, this meets your specification, but this does not. And that is the non-monotonicity I'm talking about. You retract that previous conclusion that this is a goal. So how are we going to handle this? Well, one, I want to bring up um, a computational advantage that you have with non-monotonicity. So there are some goals expressed non-monotonically that actually require you to reason over far fewer assignments. Take, for example, all stickers on the white face are different than the center sticker. So, you know, only the center sticker is going to be white on the white face of the roof. Well, there are about 3.8 times 10 to the five combinations because there are going to be five stickers excluding the white sticker. And then um, there are, um, you're looking at those eight stickers because you're excluding the center sticker. So there's going to be five to the eight um, combinations that you can reason over. Now you can specify the same set of goal states um, using this non-monotonic um, specification. So there does not exist a sticker on the white face that matches the center sticker. Now there's only going to be um, eight here because you're negating this um, statement that there exists a sticker on the white face that matches the center sticker. So the only color you care about is white. And um, there are going to be eight positions excluding the center sticker. So there are only eight assignments here. And here there's 3.8 times 10 to the 5. Um, also, if you want to identify conflicts, and when I say a conflict, I mean, um, here this is where I am talking about what a conflict is. These are assignments that cause the state not to meet the specification. So for example, if you have a sticker on the white face that is also white, that would be a conflict. So identifying conflicts um, is going to be a lot easier when you have a non-monotonic specification because all this is is model checking. So if you realize that this is not a goal state, you're just checking this unnegated um, portion of your specification and saying, um, is this true? And when you have a disjunctive logic program, this is in Cohen's loop. But if this was for a monotonic specification and you wanted to do this, um, well, you would have to say, is there some assignment that is a superset of the current one um, such that it can, you could actually find a goal state? And this is solving, and this is an NP to the NP. So it's easier to check when um, you have this non-monotonic specification. OK, so to actually handle this, what we're going to do is we're going to look at the terminal state, and we're going to find a conflict. So the first one actually doesn't care about the terminal state. We just randomly add more assignments. So we randomly specialize the assignment. And then here we have this conflict-driven specification specialization where we find a conflict and then make sure this conflict can't appear in um, the specialization of the assignment. So that will, uh, what's it called? Remove that goal state and any other um, uh, related goal states from your set of states that you could possibly observe. And so up top is what we had, um, the results that we showed previously. Here is this random specialization. It doesn't care about this black point, so this is going to be your conflict. And then here, the conflict here is going to be this black point, and the specialization won't um, include it. Here, this terminal state here is going to be your conflict, and the specialization won't include it. And um, this is going to be the conflict-driven specialization. All right, so we then combine this with a branch and bound 
algorithm. And what we're going to be doing is we're going to be sampling assignments, finding paths, and um, updating our upper bound if we find a cheaper path. And a couple notes here, I could have given a specification, you know, thousands, millions, who knows, um, assignments. And so I don't want to have to list them all to do this branching bound search. And so we limit the number of assignments to in, say 10, but if there are potentially more assignments, we put it back in the queue. So we have this complete search algorithm. It's not going to be incomplete. Um, it's going to prioritize these nodes based on the number of assignments that have been made. So the more assignments that have been made, the higher priority it gives it. And this is because um, the intuition here is that if you have more assignments, you're potentially closer to finding a solution. It's not always going to be the case, but that's just um, the intuition. And you can hopefully find an upper bound quicker by um, prioritizing things this way. And then you can ban assignments. So if you realize that any state in the set of states is not going to be of use, you can just ban the entire assignment. And this is done in the case where a path can't be found. So if you can't find a path to this set of states, obviously no subset is going to be useful. We're, we're assuming, you know, you have this deep neural network, it's not necessarily going to be the case, but that's what we assume. Um, if the lower bound is not less than the current upper bound, you know, then nothing inside that um, set of states is also going to be left. So, you know, assuming you find the shortest path, so we ban that assignment. And if you find a path to a goal state, we assume that it's via a shortest path. And so no specialization of this is, is relevant. Okay. So the experiments we have, 100 start states, and um, we have a variety of different goals that are expressed both monotonically and non-monotonically. We have a patience to wait for the upper bound to improve. We set this patience to be five iterations, and we give a 500 second time limit for each state. All right, so what are the specifications we have? So for the Rubik's Cube, we have the specification that all of the center stickers should, on the white face, should not match, should not be white. Um, this is the same as saying there does not exist a uh, um, uh, sticker on the white face that is white. Um, that is the same as the center sticker, meaning that it's not white. Um, we have for the 24 puzzle that the sum of the first row, row zero, should be even. This is the same as saying the sum of row zero is not odd. And then we have the sum of all rows should be even, or there does not exist a row um, whose sum is odd. These same set of goals. Now, um, what you can see from this table is that using the conflict-driven specialization, we find shorter paths, excuse me, in, in, a, in, a lot, in all the cases, significantly shorter. So for this Rubik's Cube, um, on average, it's 11. If we don't use the non-monotonic, if we use the monotonic special specialization, but if, sorry, the non-monotonic, the monotonic spec specification. But here, if we use um, the non-monotonic one with the conflict-driven approach, it goes down to 1.2. Um, same with 24 puzzle, 24 versus 2.5. Here, 83.7 versus 12.8. So this is a significant decrease in the path cost. Um, for the Rubik's Cube, we also find um, solutions 100% of the time, where um, here you find them 70% of the time. The other thing I wanted to draw your attention to is the time it takes to find just an assignment. So the number of seconds per um, the spec, this should actually be an assignment. So per assignment for the Rubik's Cube, remember, like I said, you're reasoning over 10 to the five combinations for the monotonic specification. And so this takes on average 12.77 um, seconds to find assignments. But for the non-monotonic one, it takes on average 0.06 seconds, so way faster. It's also way faster to find paths because you have this non-monotonic speci speci um, specification, which initially is going to be the set of all states. So to find a path is quick. But, um, even though it's not a goal state, what you can do is you can figure out why it's not a goal state. And so you're getting information even though you're failing to find a goal state with this conflict-driven approach. And this same pattern um, is there for all the different specifications. And it's also um, a lot faster. So this is on average 564 seconds, and this one is 5.98 seconds. So way faster. 
Now, you know, I was assuming that this conflict-driven specialization stuff um, would allow you to handle non-monotonic specifications, but I was not anticipating for it to actually give you shortest path, shorter paths than the monotonic one and do so faster. So um, this is a workshop paper that we have coming up at, at um, ICAPS, and this is going to have some theory and, you know, some, to give you some intuition for why this is. Um, and then here are just some examples where here's our start state, here's the monotonic specification, it finds a solution, but the task calls for 12. But here, you know, you don't want there to be a white sticker, you just move the, the space. Um, it's just task cost of one. Here you want all of the rows to sum to an even number. For the monotonic specification, it does this, but the path cost is 93. But here, the path cost is four, and um, it just requires like, moving this three up here. No, wait, moving this blank down here and just moving a couple other things around. I'm oh, sorry, moving this blank up here. And um, that's what it does, path cost of four. Okay. So now I'll go over some future work. So one, we saw with some of these special, um, some of these assignments that were generated, they actually represented unreachable goals. So um, the set of states was the empty state. And one thing we could do is we could train our heuristic functions with random mutations of these assignments. And this could generate some impossible assignments. And the cost to go that the heuristic function will learn, you know, in principle, it's infinite. But of course, uh, the heuristic function is going to learn, you know, something that's just higher than, you know, the states it usually sees. So maybe for the Rubik's Cube, it learns, you know, cost to go, say, of 100. And so we can filter out these based on, you know, some threshold. And so, you know, this could help. Another thing is, if we had more domain-specific information, um, we could reduce the number of assignments that get returned that represent impossible states. But of course, you want to keep the domain-specific engineering to a minimum. And so one thing we could do is we could use inductive logic programming to actually um, find constraints automatically based on states that fail. So if we search and search and search for um, a path and we're not able to find the path, we can assume, um, we might not be able to prove, but we can assume that this assignment represents a set of impossible states and use some inductive logic programming to figure out why. Now here, we are using answer set programming to generate assignments. And so one might then wonder, what if you just gave the specification in first order logic to your neural network directly? And so therefore we could actually um, not actually have to use answer set solvers to find assignments. We just give the um, actual logic program to the neural network. So some pros of this is you don't have to take the time to find stable models. We saw that sometimes that stable model solving process can be very slow. And the deep neural network would implicitly learn to handle this negation as failure. Um, but some cons are that this is going to then be language specific. So one benefit I think of our method is it's agnostic. You can switch out answer set programming for anything that gives you assignments and it will work. You don't have to retrain your neural network. But here, this means that if you change your language, you're probably going to have to retrain your deep neural network. It could put more burden on the deep neural network because multiple stable models um, could mean that the deep neural network has to do this work that the answer set solver would have had to do. And so maybe it needs more parameters or something to do that. And um, training can be more cumbersome because you have to take into account what your specification language actually is, whereas previously training was agnostic. And then also for future work, um, there are a lot of different applications we're interested in. So one is chemical synthesis, like I talked about previously. You may know the properties a molecule should or should not have to treat some disease, but you don't know what this molecule actually is. And of course, there are ways to find molecules that meet these specifications, but they may not be synthesizable. So you can do some kind of optimization stuff and find the molecule, but you may not be able to synthesize it. But here, if we use, um, this uh, method with deep QA and answer set programming, you could um, actually make sure that the molecules you find are synthesizable by construction, because you'll be actually just finding a path to that currently unknown molecule. Um, quantum circuit design, you can describe what an algorithm should do without knowing about what algorithm implements it. Um, manufacturing, you may know the details of what 
you want to manufacture without knowing the low level steps of how to manufacture. So that's just some um, examples of applications that we're interested in. And then here are my students that are working on this. Um, some of them have uh, papers at this ICAP conference. And yeah, so thank you to my students, very smart, hardworking students. And are there any questions? have like your, your reachability test uh, for filtering out goal candidates you want to try to reach. Um, how much of an issue is it that like your, your heuristic function is being trained? So like maybe early on, you might prune some goal candidates that you seem to be not reachable, but maybe it was just because your heuristic function just wasn't good enough to actually reach it at that point. Do you have to ever go back and look at the, the, the band uh, states or, or, or sets of goal states and, and reevaluate whether or not they're actual, actually reachable? That's a great question. So if we are training our neural network um, with some assignments that are not reachable, we actually don't have to explicitly ban them. The neural network will implicitly learn to give it a high cost to go. So for example, for soccer ban, you can have some, really, some states that have essentially infinite cost to go if you push all the boxes into corners, but you don't have to explicitly tell this to the neural network. The reinforcement learning update will learn to incorporate that. Mm -hmm. but um, your question is really relevant when we talk about actually learning constraints, because it could turn out that maybe your heuristic function just wasn't good enough to actually reach that assignment, but there were um, real states that that assignment represented. And so we would have to have a way to um, maybe keep this in mind later to correct constraints that we um, uh, falsely uh, deemed constraints. So you're progressively refining the set of potential candidate goal states, you know, for your correct training curriculum of your, your search algorithm. Um, but it's still like you're refining that set, but you're when you generate new training goal states uh, to try to reach, that's randomly sampling in that uh, set of valid goal states, right? Like you, you, it's random. Do you ever, are there any algorithms you've considered or potential ideas you've done to have like a prioritized sampling, either some kind of neural network heuristic of like what could be a more interesting goal state to sample from or, or maybe something more principled, I'm not sure. But yeah, is there any more principled algorithm uh, for, 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 for within that set, what's a good guess of what to try next? Um, have you thought about uh, any direction, anything in that direction? Yes, that's a really great question. So imagine, um, and I think that there probably are um, better algorithms out there. But like I said before, Pingo doesn't care. But imagine, you know, you are using your deep neural network with Klingo, um, you know, combining it with the anti-clip solver. That's possible. Another way that you could do this is you could, um, you know, make, start from like just this empty assignment and then iteratively uh, add assignments, but doing so such that um, your neural network is actually prioritizing which assignments you make based on how close they are. But the issue with this would be um, you may end up in a scenario where the assignments you've added result in just only non-goal states. But in order to check that, you have to use your answer set solver. And this is NP to the NP, like I mentioned before. Whereas when you have this negation as failure, it's co-NP. And so a way to do that maybe would be combining your neural network, which learns which assignments represent you know, um, impossible goal states, so you don't have to use your answer set solver, and then progressively make these assignments. Um, like use a combination of what you think might be a very short path to goal state, and also a, like a, a second value function for just like, is this a valid goal state to su actually suggest? Yes, yes. Kind of a solid related question. So, uh, suppose you have an application where you know the user may, it may be hard to specify all the constraints ahead of time. Mm -hmm. So you specify some, you find a solution, you say actually it's not a solution because it violates this constraint. Mm -hmm. It almost looks like you can fit that into your existing algorithm and have that user in the loop. Would that work? Or? Yes, that's that's a good. That this is something that's kind of related to this. But um, 
you may realize when it finds a path that actually has some property that you don't want. And you know, the benefit, like I said, with this anti-step programming is it's really easy to write that. Um, but yeah, you could have this user in the loop thing where you modify this green part here. And it actually, you know, the, this, this chunk is not going to be a goal state. And maybe you could do it such that you find solutions faster than if, you know, you just started from scratch. Yeah. All right, in that case, let's uh, thank Forrest again. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go straight to the library.